Hey everyone, in this video, we're going to talk about how to use the free cash flow to equity model to figure out what a stock is really worth. If you're new to the channel, my name is Dan. We do a lot of investment videos here. So if you're into that kind of thing, hit that subscribe button to check out my other videos. Okay, so theoretically, you got to think about the value of a stock as the same thing as the value of any asset. What's any asset worth? Well, it's worth the sum of all the money you're going to generate from it, right? That makes sense. Now, so all we have to do is add up all of the money we're going to get from owning this stock, add it together, and that's the value. So one of the first valuation models most people learn is the dividend discount model. This makes perfect sense. After all, the only cash flows you actually get as a shareholder are dividends. The problem with this model is it's very limited. It's really only useful for companies that pay a good chunk of their money out to shareholders as dividends. Some of the companies a lot of you are interested in are those more smaller companies, startups, companies that are still growing, like Netflix, Google, and such. Even if they pay a dividend, it's very low, and oftentimes they pay no dividend at all. So how can you value these with a dividend discount model? Enter the free cash flow to equity model. The idea is the same, except instead of dividends, we're going to have theoretical dividends. What could the company theoretically have paid out to us this year? And we're going to add all that up to get the value of the stock. So free cash flow to equity, we're going to call that FCFE. Here's what it's equal to, guys. We're going to start out equal to net income. So it starts out pretty simple. It's the profits the company makes during that year. We just make a few adjustments to it because we're talking about the income that can be given to equity holders. So what we're going to do, we're going to add to it net debt issued. So we're going to add up all the debt that we issue, all the money we get from that, and we're going to subtract any debt that we pay back. Because even if you have a great net income, if you're paying a lot of debt back, to, if you're repaying your debt, uh, that money is not money that can be given to the shareholders. Okay, then we subtract net capital expenditures. In the U.S., our accounting rules are such that when you buy a factory, you know, when you have any kind of capital expenditure like that, it is not going to be an expense right away. It's going to be depreciated very slowly over time as that asset is used up. Because of that, we are going to go ahead and... Uh, you know, kind of adjust that accounting ourselves. We're going to say, okay, we're going to subtract the capital expenditures we do. We're going to add back that depreciation expense. And then we subtract non-cash working capital. Excuse me. We subtract the change in non-cash working capital. So a more shorthand way to write the free cash flow from equity is given in the formula at the bottom here. So here's the idea with the model, guys. The value of a company is the sum of all the free cash flows to equity we're going to receive divided by one plus R. Now this little R here is a discount rate. It reflects the fact that you're going to have inflation. So money received, you know, in later years is worth less. So for example, the free cash flow next year, you got to discount that back divided by one plus R. You know, R is different for every company, guys. So for a risk-free asset like a treasury bill, R could be extremely low right now as I make this video in 2020. We're talking about less than, you know, a percent. So maybe 0 0.005 or something. So the money, you know, received that the next year is about the same actually as money received today. Uh, for a company, R is going to be higher. Companies have risk. You want to you know, have a higher R there, the equity premium. Right now for the S&P, the equity premium seems to be around 6% uh, given the low interest rate environment we're in. Now, you keep doing that for all the free cash flows to equity. And as you go out to the second year, you see that you're going to have to divide it by 1 plus R squared. So you're going to have you know even more discounted because it's two years out. You keep doing that dot, dot, dot all the way to infinity to a big T, which is the end of the company's life. And that will be the value of the company. Just add up all those free cash flows to equity. You can abbreviate it. You can write the formula like this. Uh, those of you that are more mathematically inclined, you may think this looks nicer. 
just the sum of, of all those free cash flows to equity. This is how the model is usually applied in practice. Financial analysts usually agree that it's very difficult to forecast beyond about five years. And even five years is, is getting pretty uh, guessy there. It's pretty hard to know. So what they do is they estimate free cash flow to equity for the next five years. They estimate at that point a terminal value. There's a couple ways to do that terminal value. But the idea is, you know, after that point, we can't keep forecasting. So what is the, the terminal value at that point? What is the company worth at that point in time? And you see, you discount them all back by the appropriate uh, time frame there. The terminal value I'm going to use is a popular one. It's not the only one, but this is the idea. You assume at that point a free cash flow to equity for period six, and you divide it by the discount rate minus the G stable, where a G stable is a stable growth rate from that point forward. Most people choose a growth rate of anywhere from you know one to four percent. Uh, most commonly is about two or three percent. In the long run, it's going to be hard for businesses to grow their free cash flow at a rate that exceeds the growth in the GDP. Okay, so let's see how this works using Walmart as an example. So here I have financial data for Walmart. I went ahead and calculated their free cash flow to equity for the past four years, plus the uh, most recent, we got trailing 12 months. Trailing 12 months means you're in the middle of a fiscal year. So what you do is just the last 12 months worth of financial data. So for Walmart, they're only two quarters into this year, actually. So we have those two quarters of 2020 plus the last two quarters of 2019. That's what TTM means, that trailing 12 months. Uh, what I see here is a tremendous growth in free cash flow to equity in the most recent trailing 12 months measure. That is concerning to me for my forecasting because I'm not sure how to interpret that, whether that is going to continue or not. So what I'm going to do is take an average of the past three years. Uh, what I'm basically assuming some of that growth is going to continue. I'm going to give them some credit for that. But I will also say that some of it will, will not continue. It's just temporary, maybe because of the pandemic. So that's my estimate right there going forward for the free cash flow to equity. The next thing we need to do to estimate all the free cash flows to equity is just to estimate how much they'll grow by over the next five years. So here I just use financial analyst consensus forecast data from seekingalpha.com. And what I can find here is the earnings per share forward long-term growth rate is about 6.08%. And I'm going to go ahead and use that number. Okay, so if I use that 6.08% and I'm looking at uh, next year, free cash flow to equity, then I grow that by 6%. And you can see, I can just go ahead and fill in the numerators for this formula here. The next thing I need to do is estimate a stable growth rate. So I'm going to go with 2.5%. That seems reasonable to me long term from Walmart. And then finally, that little r. Now, that's always the hardest part to estimate. Uh, you can try a number of different values and see what, uh, how that changes the valuation. I'm actually going to go pretty low. I'm going to go with 5%. One of the reasons I'm doing that is I do view Walmart as a very stable business. And so with that, I can then calculate with a calculator with Excel, what is the value of the company? Okay, so the final step is to take the value you get from that formula, that's the intrinsic value of the company, and compare that to the stock price today. If the value you get is more than what the stock is currently priced at, we say that the stock is undervalued. Now, if your value is extremely different than the stock price, you know, I'm talking three times what the stock price is, you either have a really good deal or perhaps you should rethink some of the assumptions you put into the model. Is your discount rate way too low? Is your growth rate way too high? Some of these things could be throwing you off there. Most of the time, large companies that are followed by a lot of financial analysts, they tend to be priced efficiently meaning 
it's going to be very hard to find a company that is undervalued by, say, 40%, or some, something like that. A lot of the good deals in the stock market would be companies that are rather neglected, not being followed by a lot of people. With those caveats in mind, I think this is a great method to help value companies, and I hope you find it useful. If you do, hit that like button. It helps me a lot. Thank you.